Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we will discuss the importance of protecting America's endangered wildlife and the implications for our ecosystems with our special guest, Khan Omara, President and CEO of the National Wildlife Federation. Colin, thank you so much for joining us. I see you're in the wilds of America, and, and I, I see behind you the trail uh, leading off. So it's great to to interrupt your hike and and uh, and be able to chat about uh, about the fact that a third of America's species, a third, a third of those species that live in water and on land risk extinction. And uh, we all know that all species are, are affected by climate change. I was looking at some of the statistics surrounding the, the uh, impact of the wildfires that are uh, spreading across the West on wildlife. And it's just incredibly de devastating. So um, help us understand how the National Wildlife Federation works to prevent the death and disappearance of whole categories of American wildlife. Yeah, no, first of all, Mark, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate the, the invitation. And you set it up perfectly. I mean, right now, uh, about one third of all species are at heightened risk of extinction in the U.S. Um, we've done a remarkable job saving the species that we hunt and fish and also a pretty good job of saving species that are on the brink of extinction. Um, but it's kind of everything else that we're, we're lacking. And so the, uh, the National Wildlife Federation was created in 1936. Um, it was actually uh, came out of a convening by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, where he basically brought folks together from across the country to talk about the, the future of, of wildlife resources, which at the time, um, this is at the height of the depression, um, were in, in kind of rough shape. Uh, you know, there were, it's hard to imagine today, but, you know, there, were, there weren't that many deer on the landscape. You know, the, the, the freshwater fish populations had collapsed. The bison had already been shot off the plains. The pa passenger pigeons had been shot out of the sky. Um, and so the idea was to kind of come together and bring folks from all different backgrounds, not just, you know, conservationists, but, you know, kind of sportsmen and sportswomen, hunters, um, anglers, you know, farmers, ranchers, 4-H uh, clubs, garden clubs. I mean, the early Audubon Society members, early Sierra Club members, early Ducks Unlimited, folks that founded Ducks Unlimited were there. Um, and at the end of the, this three-day session, um, uh, they basically said, like, let's become an organization. Let's actually, let's actually organize. And the idea was to be a full-blown federation. So we have uh, affiliates in all 53 states, or 50, 50 states, and then the, the three territories, three of the territories. Um, and, and really, I mean, we're 6 million strong. Um, we'd love to have all your, all your followers join us too. But this, it's, um, it spans the political spectrum. I got, you know, about 35% of my, my members are Republicans, about 38% are Democrats. Um, you know, at a time when we're pretty divided as a country, this seems to be an area that folks can still come together. Um, and at the same time, to your point, that, you know, if we don't get ahead of some of the massive impacts we're seeing in the landscape now, as climate change is affecting everything from the horrific fires and drought we're seeing in the West, the floods and the hurricanes that we're seeing in the East, um, that the impacts on wildlife are, are pretty devastating. And you know, so it, right now we're at a moment where we, we have, to, have to act urgently because the, the crisis is intensifying. Um, I think uh, one, of the, one of the things that I'd like, to, I, I'd like to really discuss a lot more is this idea of, of the conservation mission that you have is in everybody's interest, every American's interest. It doesn't really matter whether you're living in a city or you're living in a rural area. This is really important in that origin of being very inclusive and focused on, on America and the nature of America and the nature of our relationship with our natural world um, is so important. So let's go back to this whole idea of inclusivity because so much of the conservation um, arena is really uh, defined by what you're against, right? If, you're, if, if you have a business interest, you're, you're obviously going to be against the environmentalist. If you're an environmentalist, you're obviously going to be suing uh, hunters, uh, right? But that's not so obvious when you have an organization where you're saying, okay, let's, let's get together and talk about what our relationship is as a country, as a people to these species, right? Do we want to live in an America where there is nothing wild? Um, and or if or where wild is kind of restricted to, to little conservation parks. So um, let's talk about how you actually operate and how you ensure that that balance is maintained through your history, because you've been around for such a long time. How do you do that? Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing is fo focusing on the, on the commonalities. Right. I mean, I, I often say, like, when we save wildlife, we save ourselves. And what I mean by that is that, you know, we're also a species. Right? Like we're also we need healthy air. We need clean water. Um, you know, we need. And there's a food chain, right? I mean, there yeah. is a natural food chain. If we just dis disrupt insects 
for example, it's going to have a huge amount of, of impact downstream. Yeah, well, so let's use that example. So, I mean, if, if right now, you know, about half of pollinator populations are in trouble um, across the country. I mean, in about a third, one of every third, three bites of food we eat is po- from pollinated, you know, fruits or vegetables or, or the like. And so, you know, I mean, it has massive impacts on our, our day-to-day life. Um, and like you said, I mean, I, I do think the dichotomy in the 70s and 80s in particular was very much environment versus business and you couldn't have both. Um, I think we're trying to show like we, we don't have a choice. <laughs> like we, we need both. You know, places that have healthier natural resources are able to withstand, you know, the fires and floods more because you have natural systems to absorb, you know, some of those, some of the, um, some of the impacts in real ways. You know, places that have healthier natural resources have stronger outdoor recreation economies. Folks would like to visit places that are, are you know, have, have healthy natural resources and abundant wildlife. Young people are deciding increasingly where to live first and where to work second. And in this increased world, and we're, we're, obviously we're doing this on Zoom right now, you know, in a teleworking reality for a lot of young professionals, they can live anywhere they want. Um, and so they want to be in places where, you know, they have healthy natural resources. And so it's in people's economic interests. It's in their kind of personal health interest, as well as I, I would argue we have a kind of a moral responsibility to, to, to protect the, the species that we're, we're blessed with. But it's, it's trying to find those sweet spots. And, you know, the thing that's interesting for me is, you know, the, the national narrative is so often that, you know, like Democrats are good on these issues or Republicans are bad on that. And it's, it's so much more complicated. I mean, one of the most bipartisan series of wins of the last few years in the Congress um, have actually been over conservation. Um, it's been funding for our national parks, funding for our wildlife refuges, funding for you know, land acquisitions and local parks. Now, there's still a huge political divide on, on things like regulation and the role of like EPA and like, you know, th- those kind of questions. But it's more of a question of, of means as opposed to ends. And so I think the more I can focus on that 80 percent that we can agree on and kind of leave the tails of the you know, kind of the 10 percent of areas on by both extremes where we disagree, um, we can still move some big things. Because frankly, we're at a time we, we can't afford to be such to be so pure that we're losing um, when people fight, wildlife loses. Yeah, well, look at look at Florida. Florida has a huge environmental tourism or in, environmentally connected tourism industry, and so conservation of the uh, of the uh, Everglades and um, and those uh, those sanctuaries for birds and, and and other wildlife is a big big part. Look at what happened uh, down in the Gulf in Louisiana, where the fishing industry is so. Uh, incredibly invested in in the environmental quality. Um, I want to also um, get to how you compose your board because you know over time organizations are composed of people. So if you're going to maintain balance, you have to have balance in your board. You have to have balance in your staff, and representation is also important. Where we're we're past the point where we can decide that uh, in the environmental movement that um, we can be talking just to. Um, the the people who founded the movement, who are very often uh, white and male and in power and uh, and landed and so on. Um, how do you uh, ensure through the mix of people that you bring into your board that you have these different groups, these different constituencies, different ethnicities, different interests, rural, uh, business, um, uh, uh, environmental scientists, and so on? How do you make sure that 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 is represented on your staff and your board? Yeah, no, and, and I, I'll get to that in just a second. I mean, I think on in, in your, in your first point around, like Florida is a perfect example, right? Where like the blue-green algae, the, the, the red tide, I mean, the folks that are screaming for clean water the loudest are folks that, that have, you know, outdoor charter boat companies, the hotels. I mean, it's folks on Sanibel Island, right? And so like, it's, it's, a, it's, it's changing the, the conversation. So it's not just like the greenies, right, coming in saying this is important. It's, you know, it's an economic, right. like, economic necessity, not kind of an environmental nicety, um, if you will. I, and for us, I mean, like we're committed to being a 21st century organization. And you can't be a modern organization, as you said, unless you represent the full diversity of the of the country. And you know, we we have had if you look at the 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 you know the general the, the board chairs of the federation over its you know eighty year history, you got you know about seventy years of, of sixty five years of mostly white folks, um, and then you know pretty good diversity in the last few years. And we, we're one of the first national nonprofits to have a, a Latino uh, board chair right now. Um, we've had you know kind of we've had an interesting kind of leadership over the evolve over the, the last few years, but about, about almost 30% of our board are, are folks of color. Um, we have, we have representation from tribes. We have representation from um, leaders in the, in the black community, leaders in the Latino community, Latino, Latino community, um, Pacific Island leaders as well, uh, native Hawaiian. Um, and, and, and so we have a pretty big board organizationally. We're about 36 right now, I think 35 mm-hmm. or 36. Um, but our board is a little different than most in that half of our, uh, half of our board members actually come from our affiliates. So we're elected almost more like, it's like a labor structure, um, and that, you know, the, the local districts actually send, you know, delegates that, that come from their, um, from their, their regions. Um, and so trying to make sure that we're, that we're having that level of diversity across the, um, the board 
um, requires everyone being bought in on this vision that inclusivity and kind of reaching true. It's equity not the worst way to way. go, right? When right. people have to have to be elected, they have to communicate how they think to others. And so constituents get to engage in dialogue. That dialogue itself really does advance. And the other the other piece that I think is really interesting about your organization is that it is essentially a coalition that it depends on being able to serve members who have divergent interests but that uh, that encourages everybody to talk about where those interests diverge and where those there might be commonality so if it doesn't get out of hand into what what becomes a political food fight which is what what we so often have in in our government um, it can be incredibly productive. So let's talk a little bit about how you translate that into action, how you actually create impact through that coalition building. Could you just talk about some of the programs that you've been able to enact over the last couple of years? Yeah, and, and, and just and this is where it all connects, because I, I do think so our, our governance structure, um, we actually have a, an annual meeting every year where all of our all of our 50 state affiliates and our territorial affiliates get together um, and actually pass resolutions. I mean, they actually have the debate. I mean, so you'll have you know, the North Dakota folks and the West Virginia folks, you know, arguing with the California folks and the, you know, the, the Massachusetts folks, right? I mean, you'll have these, you know, kind of interesting, and that, that informs a lot of our work because we kind of see where the, the, the kind of the common ground is. Um, we see like where those opportunities are, and that does inform a lot of our work. I mean, one of the areas that we've been spending a lot of time on lately um, is really trying to elevate the environmental justice work because, you know, and folks often use the analogy of like the canary in the coal mine. I mean, we do have sacrifice zones in this country that have suffered just the greatest level of degradation, the greatest amount of pollution. Um, obviously, it, it maps very closely with levels of poverty, levels of um, you know, communities of color. Um, and so Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali is our vice president for environmental justice and community revitalization and climate, and in, in his portfolio, really trying to make sure those local solutions are being brought to the national level. There's great work going on all across the country. And because of the access that we have to you know, elected officials in the White House and in the Congress and the like, um, making sure those voices are, are told, but not, not again, appropriating the ideas, but really letting folks speak for themselves and just kind of opening doors. And, and a lot of the things you're seeing in the infrastructure package right now, both the kind of the bipartisan one, as well as the reconciliation package, were informed by those, those conversations. Huge focus right now on the wildlife side um, around investing in proactive collaborative work. Um, we have a bit of a train wreck coming, and this gets back to your comments at the top. The number of species that are at risk right now is right. massive. And we have 1,600 species that are already listed on the Endangered Species Act. We got another couple thousand in the queue. If we don't invest in their habitat, like we can't regulate our way out of this problem. So there's an act called the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. That's a huge priority for us. Um, it's led by Roy Blunt, a Republican from Missouri, and Martin Heinrich, a Democrat from from New Mexico, as well as Debbie Dingell, a Democrat from Michigan, and, and Jeff Fortenberry, a Republican from, from Nebraska, and completely bipartisan. But the idea is to invest in proactive, collaborative work. And it's fascinating that it's, it's, I've got some of the most conservative members of Congress and some of the most progressive members of Congress all working together on this because they're all saying, look, this is a better way to save wildlife than well, fighting out of the I mean, it. come on. Uh, you know, why, why, do, why does everything have to be about, um, you know, political party? I, there are in, there are common interests that we have here, and if we if we can just talk about those common interests, we can solve a lot of problems. You know, we just uh, asked this this question where we said, "What do you think is the top driver of, of wildlife extinctions?" And we we included some of the um, ele uh, of of the answers that in previous uh, times we would have probably gotten a lot of votes, right? Pollution, climate change. Um, non-human factors and so on and so forth, 100% of the people who responded say it's human development of land and water and loss of habitat. So let's, let's focus on, on that idea, human development of, uh, on land and water and loss of habitat. So when, when you have humans who are just sort of doing their everyday life, right? Business, uh, you know, I just bought a product and it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a food product that's in a little plastic um, a tray that comes out of a box, a paper box. You got plastic and then you got paper box and it's wrapped in plastic. And then it comes in a bigger box that then is wrapped in, in, in shrink wrap all around to protect it from, from humidity. And it's flown on an airplane from, from some destination and it lands in my Costco or whatever. Um, so that's my normal day. Right. If I'm a if I'm a real estate developer, I'm developing stuff. If I'm a road builder, I'm building roads. When we talk about solving this problem of human development on land and water, right, and, and the impact that we have, how do we get us all to act differently? How do we get me to act differently as a consumer? Yeah, I mean, 
I think one of the one of the challenges is that you know we've we've for a long time just had this kind of in, insatiable demand for more and more goods, um, and you know kind of cheaper and cheaper goods, and 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 for the most part we haven't had the real conversation about like, the end of life of a lot of the products. We were actually pretty far behind other parts of the world, and then we've seen you know kind of the massive efforts in you know recycling, which are fantastic. There's not enough markets for a lot of the materials at this point, so we're having you know things end up in you know ports that don't really have anywhere to go, and I think that the I mean, at this point, we have to be talking about the kind of source reduction and a kind of reuse in a, in a major way. And again, you know, it's, it's funny. I was, I was at, a, at a press conference a few years ago. We were announcing this huge, you know, kind of composting operation, trying to have, you know, more organic waste being used instead of landfilled and reducing methane emissions and having better soil and the like. And my, uh, my grandmother at the time, at the event, said to me afterwards, she's like, she's like I don't know why y'all think this is so fancy. Like, we had slop buckets in the 30s. Like this isn't this isn't anything innovative, and so in some ways I think like thinking back, you know, kind of some, to some of the practices of the past, and at the same time recognizing we have these huge systemic drivers, right? I mean, the amount of pollution coming out of like the fossil fuel industry, you know, the the kind of the insatiable demand for kind of greenfield development instead of having to do more like brownfield development and kind of redevelopment in cities. I mean, the way that we kind of allow sprawl to kind of get out of control in a lot of places instead of having more density. Um, so there's a lot of moving pieces. I think one of the things that we push for is as much as I want the big systemic changes. Um, I also want to be focused on you know, those individual place-based projects where it's a little tweak, right? It's saving a little space for nature, you know, can reconnecting some habitat, you know, having corridors or crossings that over that connect highways. I mean, we have four million acre, four million miles of additional highways in this country over the last like fifty years. I mean, like those are the kinds of pieces, but it does take everyone, and at the same time, we have to address the systemic drivers that kind of push us towards this ever and ever demanding need for more and more natural resources at the expense of any kind of sustainable outlook. So what you're saying is we are the, we are the drivers of the harm, and if we're going to actually uh, uh, have harm reduction, we've got to stop driving the harm. That's right. Yeah, and and, and look, and I think I mean obviously climate overlays all of this because you know I mean to to the question in the, in the poll, right? I mean habitat loss is by far the the biggest the biggest driver, and, and habitat degradation and fragmentation. You know, but we have invasive species, we have you know, pollution, we have all kinds of um, all kinds of challenges with emerging diseases. And then you have climate change that's kind of accelerating all of that. So, you know, affecting you know, water quality, water quantity levels in some places, you know, destroying habitat in other places, moving temperature ranges. But, you know, we, we are kind of the ones we've been waiting for, right? I mean, that, that old adage, like it's going to take, you know, a collective action. The government alone can't solve this. Like individuals are going to have to, whether it's a small creature like the monarch butterfly or a big creature like the bison and kind of everything in between. What are the largest um, uh, challenges that, and the highest priority challenges, either by species or by uh, the type of program, that really should receive um, disproportionate investment? I mean, I, I do think that um, we, we've spent a lot of time and resources on the species we hunt and fish, and, and to great outcomes. I mean, our duck populations are healthy. I mean, they're up fifty six percent over the last forty years when everything else has kind of crashed. You know, deer populations are insane pretty much everywhere. Right. Um, I, I worry about the smaller species. Um, I worry about, you know, invertebrates. I worry about pollinators in, in particular. Um, I worry about, you know, the, the songbirds and the forest birds and the shorebirds that just don't get the same amount of attention. Um, so invertebrates, yeah. invertebrates. Um, uh, so uh, examples would include? Yeah, so a lot, a lot, of, a lot of insects, um, a lot of, you know, a lot of organisms that are, are critical in the food chain, right? In the kind of the food Really web, tiny, yeah. right? You know, yeah. the grasshoppers so, that, that the birds eat and... And, and, health, and healthy caterpillars, right? That are important for bird populations and caterpillar right. populations decline because you don't have native trees. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the populations of amphibians and, and reptiles right now are, don't receive a lot of attention, but are incredibly important. I mean, the role that frogs play in the system, the role that, you know, salamanders and snakes and and um, you know, turtles. I mean, like, there's a whole range of species, and most of that work, like most of the species, could be saved with more investment. I mean, there's some kind of bigger shifts with the climate, but you know, it's a friend of mine uses this great analogy where it's like it's like you know, it's like we're flying an airplane, right? You start taking off individual bolts, and you don't know like which individual bolt is going to have the whole thing collapse. But that's kind of what the food web is like, right? Like if you don't you don't know like which piece of it gets pulled out is going to cause collapse. Like we don't want to be playing roulette with our future when there's investments we can make that are very cost effective. They could save all the species. You know, we just to finish a a, uh, a uh, poll in which we asked how much money should we commit to improving the, the survival chances of American species, and it split uh, basically 60-40. sixty forty. Sixty percent said uh, we should spend an amount that we all notice through increased taxes, and the other uh, the other said we should allocate money. We should reallocate money, but no new taxes. Um, could you talk about this whole idea of? of us spending money, more money, right? The, the no new taxes thing is, is, is really convenient, right? It's sort of like, we're not gonna really feel it. 
but but it's a good thing to spend money on, right? Whereas when the reason why we asked the first question was, you know, we're, we're going to have to spend some money. We're going to be actually taxed more. How much is it worth to you? Um, so could you talk a little bit about this notion of do we actually have to, as Americans, sacrifice something for our wildlife? And, and, and what is that calculus? How do, how do your members think about that calculus? Yeah, I mean, I mean, right now we spend less than one half of 1% of the federal budget on kind of natural resources. I mean, it's a staggeringly small number um, across the entire portfolio. And, and I would argue that like, you can actually do, I mean, I, I think it's sort of a false choice. I mean, I think we can actually spend the amount we need to within existing, existing resources. I mean, I think we could save the vast majority of the, of the you know, 12,000 species of greatest conservation need for about $1.4 billion a year. Um, which sounds like a big number to like me and you, but like in the grand scheme of things, it's nothing, right? I mean, it's a fraction of- you know, 1.4 billion, billion where, where we have a, a you know, $1 trillion infrastructure uh, budget exactly. and a 3.5 uh, human infrastructure budget, yeah. whatever you want to call it, um, um, on, in the offing. I, I'm not sure that, what did you say, 1.5 billion? One point, yeah, if I, if I, we could have 1.4 a year dedicated to the kind of the, the, diverse, the full diversity of wildlife investors in the States, Few hundred million dollars more for the um, the federal government to help recover list, listed species already. I mean, for less than less. I mean, it's 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 a fraction of nothing. And um, the bill that I mentioned before, the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, would actually do that. It would dedicate that kind of funding um, because at the end of the day, like it's that sustained investment that's going to be that's going to be needed. But it's it like it really is a fraction of nothing. I mean, we've been basically funding um, the recovery of, of, of species we hunt and fish through an excise tax, an existing excise tax on on, on ammunition and firearms and, and fishing tackle. Um, for, for, you know, 50 years in one case, 70 years in one case, 90 years in the other case. Um, and, and, and again, those kind of models are just applying existing revenues towards wildlife. Um, so folks don't really feel it, but they're getting the benefit. The other thing I'd say to your, to your, to your listeners though, is that we're already paying for it, right? So like when something, when a species has to be listed, there's economic impacts from that. When, you know, a habitat get, gets decimated, there's co- there's costs to that. So we're just incredibly penny wise and pound stupid. Like, it's just like, we're not, you know, we're not making the upfront investments. So then we end up paying the catastrophic costs in the back end or that ounce of prevention really is worth that pound of cure. You know, um, I appreciate your, your pointing to the, uh, one, to the 1.5 billion, but I personally don't believe it. Um, I personally um, have, have a view that until we all change our behaviors, our small behaviors, and I cited my own example, um, you know, the car that I drive, the, the products that I purchase, uh, even what I plant in my garden, until we actually change um, our behaviors, um, the drivers of these these changes, um, are, that drive that driver, which is us, isn't going to be addressed. So, um, spending one point five billion dollar on, on the back end to try and repair repair some ba- some past harm and try to ameliorate future harm that we do, it just seems to me to be the wrong way uh, 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 to look at the solution. It's it, it's a component certainly. Um, but but um, in, in terms of, of how your various um, component parts, your your affiliates actually function, um, how do they function within their individual markets? Do they each uh, try and carry parts of this message and do you use them as as kind of you, you talked about learning from them and, and facilitating in, in communication? But do you also function a little bit as a galvanizing force to create models of behavior um, or, or ideas that could be deployed each in, each according to their own lights um, so that so that on a local level, we're all changing ourselves in these small ways that might be helpful. Yeah, I mean, I think it gets back to your last question, right? It's, it's both hand. And so like we, we sort of function like NATO. Um, so like if there's federal opportunities, everyone to kind of come together and you know, kind of work um, to pass legislation together like the one I mentioned. Um, and again, that legislation is to get us to a point where you know, species are surviving. Um, that's not, not to get to thriving like you're talking about. And we're actually doing the, you know, everyone's doing the hard work themselves to have habitat in their backyards and the like. Um, but, the, but then, and then there's also great work going on in every state. And so, you know, in some one state, it might be a campaign around you know, wildlife corridors. Another place, it might be a, a water, a fresh water campaign or a clean water campaign. And somebody else, it might be around, um, you know, litter and cleanups and outdoor recreation. I mean, they, and, and the idea is that we provide additional firepower on the ground to support those efforts. Um, really, a lot of sharing best practices and getting folks, you know, hey, you know, folks in Minnesota are thinking about this. Like, that aligns with something that Arkansas was doing two years ago. Let's learn from each other what, what worked, what didn't. Um, and so like the camaraderie that comes from having that kind of like living network um, where folks are talking, we call it kind of our one federation. 
um, where we're really trying to all work together all the time. Like in, in addition to the thousands of other partners we work with on the ground, um, this idea that you know most of the big questions are being dealt with somewhere else, right? So we can just like learn from like what's working and replicate it and scale it. Um, that's one of the best ways to drive change everywhere in the country. When you get to the policy area, you do enter into the you do dip your water uh, your your toe into the uh, into the political waters. Um, you were referring to uh, some of the legislation that you were uh, um, advancing, and you you referred to uh, bipartisan supporters both in the Senate and uh, in the House. Are there other areas where you are engaged in um, in political advocacy uh, or what would be called political advocacy? that we should all know about? Yeah, so I mean, we, we have one of the larger um, kind of teams of folks kind of focusing on legislation of any of the NGOs in the country. And you know, and we're working on, like, I mean, we talked about the wildlife funding and some of the environmental justice work, but I mean, huge teams around water, huge teams around agriculture, forestry, um, looking at, you know, the big regional water programs. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of focus right now on infrastructure, of course, and making sure it's as kind of wildlife friendly and kind of climate smart as possible. I mean, we're doing more and more in the clean And it's all about space. sustainable ecosystems, right? Exactly. You're not, you don't have a, an agenda beyond a, a healthy ecosystem that is a great habitat for wildlife, healthy wildlife populations. That's your entire agenda, right? Exactly. And, and, and then making the case that those systems are actually going to help uh, save us, right? They're going to make us more resilient to these fires and floods and other, and other pieces. And, and the nice thing is that that's a bipartisan message, right? I mean, there's folks that are saying, look, we need healthier forests because the kind of the disrepair we're seeing in our forests is contributing to these massive mega fires. Now, climate is a huge part of it, too, and obviously invasive species and the like. But like it's, it's, it's a way to bring people together. And I think, you know, one of the things we try to kind of make the case that like there is no Republican, you know, white tailed deer. There's no Democratic, you know, small mouth bass, as a friend of mine says. Um, and that these things shouldn't be partisan, as I think you've laid out nicely over this interview. So we just uh, completed another another poll. And um, after this, I'm going to give you uh, sort of a last a last word. I mean, I, this has just been such a fascinating, fascinating discussion. Um, the, the, the last poll we asked, we, we forced people into a single choice. We asked, uh, what should we be doing? What should we each be doing to improve the chances of, uh, for survival of America's wildlife? And we had... Um, a number of people who said educate ourselves and reduce our end use of fossil fuels, but the but the greatest um, answer, which is fifty six percent, was implement legislation and policies that protect wildlife. You know, it seems that we're ready as a country to actually do stuff. Um, right now, there is some controversy as to whether we're going to actually have to uh, make a financial sacrifice and we would spend more to do stuff. But it looks like that there is some sort of a consensus building that it is, it is part of our national identity to have uh, a healthy, wild uh, ecosystem. So could you, as, as, as you take us out, because we're, we're coming to the end of our uh, 30 minutes, uh, could you uh, give us all a sense of what we could do today and tomorrow, aside from writing you a check, um, which we're all welcome to do. Um, but what can, what can we do on a, on a micro level? How can we get involved? If you were going to um, whisper in our ears and then we took your advice, what would that advice be? Yeah, I, I'd ask each of you to do three things. Um, and I think the, the first thing is, you know, kind of the act locally. Um, there, there's great opportunities to do a little bit of habitat, habitat no, reservation. Act, act locally. Yeah, I mean, in, in, my, in my first ask, it's just, you know, if there's an opportunity to plant a native plant, you know, have a little milkweed for a monarch, have a little, you know, have, a, have, some, have some native, you know, cone flowers or, you know, for pollinators, um, just do something active on whether you have, a, whether you have a, a yard or even just a windowsill or just a, you know, a, a box, I mean, anything in between. Um, doing a little, a little action um, goes a long way. And, and, it, and it actually makes, it makes a difference. It's not just, it's not just symbolic. It actually will, will help. With the numbers, so that's the first thing. The second thing is um, spend more time outdoors. I mean, get get get, especially with fam, fam, family family and friends that don't spend time outdoors. Like just getting them to appreciate. I think the pandemic actually helped because I think like look as we become more and more attached to our damn phones and our you know and and, and, and living on Zoom screens all the time. I, I worry that some of the gains for folks spending more time in nature are being lost a little bit, especially to get back in their cars and you know, as we come out of the the pandemic. Um, but I, I think that you know we only love we only protect what we love, and so having that connection is important. And then the third thing is on, to your point, is on the, the advocacy side, um, like letting your local elected officials know that this is important. You know, wildlife can't speak for themselves, so, you know, we have to. And so, you know, they, they don't vote, they don't write checks. And so, you know, at the end of the day, it's going to take folks. And I mean, the, the most important thing right now 
is this is this Recovering America's Wildlife Act that I've mentioned a few times. I mean, we haven't had a signature in, uh, wildlife piece of legislation in this country since the Endangered Species Act passed in 1973. Um, this would be the game changer. And again, it's not to get, this is basically to make sure all the species survive. Um, you know, then, then the next level is kind of getting to the, you know, the level of connected, connected ecosystems that we're going to need. Um, but this is a huge win. It's definitely in play for this Congress. It could, it could easily get done. I would encourage everyone to go to the nwf.org website. It's NWF National Wildlife Federation, nwf.org website. You can learn more about it. You can reach out to me. Um, and we'd love to have you get involved. And then also, you know, getting involved with your state affiliates. If there's things you're concerned about in your particular state or your community, um, every one of our 50 affiliates would love to have folks, you know, involved for volunteer projects or ideas or advocacy. Um, lots of opportunities to make a difference. Well, this, is, this has just been great. I would add a fourth uh, uh, element to the your list. Of free. Let's just let's just talk to each other because um, we're going to find that we agree on a lot more than we think. And once we reach agreement, once we um, educate each other on our various positions, and we start to find the things that we can agree on, we can actually take action that we agree uh, are are in uh, mutual interests. Colin O'Mara, President and CEO of the National Wildlife Federation, thank you so much for sharing the work of your organization. Please thank your board, thank your staff, thank your donors, thank your communities um, and your affiliates. Uh, it's just it's just wonderful to, uh, that you were able to be here today to share some of the work that you do. Thanks again for having me. It's great to be with you. Everybody have a great day. Mask up. Stay safe.